Hi, this is Charlie Lowenstein. I'm the Chief of Cardiology at the Johns Hopkins University School of Medicine. And along with Dr. Jim Gammy, we are the co-directors of the Heart and Vascular Institute, or HVI. And we're welcoming you to the Johns Hopkins Medicine Online Webinar Series, which is focused tonight on the Johns Hopkins Hypertrophic Cardiomyopathy Center. And the topic for today is understanding hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. When I spoke briefly for part one in early December, I recounted the history of Hopkins and the hypertrophic cardiomyopathy and people from Hopkins and how they've been involved in hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. And I focused on a controversy that started back in the 1960s, which is, is hypertrophic cardiomyopathy more a disease of hypercontractility, too much squeezing, or is it a disease of obstruction? So in part one last month, we discussed diagnosis and treatment of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. And tonight, we're going to focus on arrhythmias, more about management, and then special issues that involve hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. So welcome, and I'd like to introduce you to the director of the Johns Hopkins Hypertrophic Cardiomyopathy Center, Dr. Jose Madrazo. Jose. Thank you, Dr. Lowenstein, for the introduction. I'm very excited to have everybody here. Thank you to everybody joining. Thank you to all the panelists that will be speaking today. This is truly a team effort. Um, we have a uh, packed agenda. Um, so today we're gonna be covering a uh, topic spanning from arrhythmias, both from the bottom of the heart, which are the ones that could potentially cause sudden cardiac death, as well as from the top of the heart, like atrial fibrillation. Uh, management of advanced heart failure, including transplant, uh, some special topics of interest on counseling, such as exercise and pregnancy. Um, we will uh, wrap up uh, management of uh, septal modification uh, procedures or the surgical management of HCM. Uh, last time we had alcohol ablations, today we'll talk about surgery. And then uh, last but not least, talk about uh, participation in research and ongoing uh, research efforts uh, in HCM at Johns Hopkins. Um, so I would like to uh, be brief and get us going so that we also have time for questions and answers at the end. I'd like to introduce Dr. Andreas Barth, uh, who is the uh, director for the Center of the Inherited Heart Diseases, and he will be talking about sudden cardiac death in HCM. Thank you again for joining. Dr. Barth, unmute yourself. Here we go. So good evening. I hope that uh, you can hear me now. Um, I'm going to talk tonight about the risk of sudden cardiac death and hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. And so why do patients with uh, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy need to be evaluated for the risk of, of sudden cardiac death? Well, sudden cardiac death is a catastrophic complication or can be a catastrophic complication of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy that is caused by fatal arrhythmias. And unfortunately, in some patients, sudden cardiac death may be the very first presentation of the disease. So patients may not be even aware that they have hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, uh, may show no other manifestations, but sudden cardiac death or so fatal arrhythmia may be the first manifestation. And in this sense, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy remains the most common cause of sudden cardiac death in young athletes. Now, fortunately, sudden cardiac death in hypertrophic cardiomyopathy is rare. Annually, if you look across all patients with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, we see it about in 1% patients per year. However, there are some patients who are at very high risk, and it is very important to identify those patients who are at highest risk because sudden cardiac death is largely preventable by implanting defibrillators, or as we call them, ICDs. So this is what uh, a fatal arrhythmia would look like. This is a normal cardiac rhythm uh, where you see a regular cardiac activity, but in patients who are at risk of sudden cardiac death, it can develop into this very fast and disorganized rhythm 
which is uh, ventricular fibrillation. And essentially the heart stops pumping at that time. It's like an electrical accident of the heart. You can restore the normal electrical function by defibrillating the heart. So traditionally, there are two ways of doing it, either with external defibrillators. That, that works great if you have, if it is a witnessed cardiac arrest and there is somebody there who has access to an external defibrillator. So there are two conditions that are, you have to be really lucky to survive a cardiac arrest um, in, in the field without an implantable defibrillator. This is why we have the implantable cardiac defibrillator. So uh, it's a little device, it's a little computer with a battery that is implanted under the skin, under the left collarbone, and it's connected to the heart with an insulated wire, which we call a lead. And that lead can detect each single heartbeat. If the patient has a normal heart rhythm at a normal rate, the defibrillator just sits there and monitors. But should the patient go into a develop, should the patient develop a dangerous, life-threatening fast arrhythmia, the defibrillator will be able to detect that and react appropriately within seconds. It can deliver therapies, either try to pace the patient out of this dangerous arrhythmia, or it can defibrillate the patient. It's like having EMS in a box with you at all times. And there are also newer versions of um, the defibrillators that are not implanted to a vein where the lead goes through a vein into the heart, but so the, the defibrillator is, uh, sits in the armpit rather than under the left collarbone. And it also has a lead, but that lead is tunneled under the skin on top of the rib cage. So it doesn't touch the heart directly. Both defibrillators are able to uh, provide crucial therapies if the patients ever develop any of those dangerous fast arrhythmias. And as Dr. Lowenstein mentioned, um, we have a long history of defibrillators here at Hopkins. And defibrillators were actually developed by a Hopkins physician in the mid 1960s um, here at Hopkins. And the first defibrillator was implanted at Johns Hopkins Hospital worldwide. Uh, the first defibrillator was implanted in 1980. And fortunately, the technology has evolved significantly and has improved over um, the last decades. And um, we implant nowadays in the United States more than 150,000 defibrillators each year. Now, fortunately, sudden cardiac death remains rare and few patients really are at such a high risk that they require implantation of ICDs. So now the question is, how do we identify those patients who would really benefit from an ICD? Well, the first one are patients if, who had a cardiac arrest or who have evidence of sustained ventricular arrhythmia. So who have evidence of this fast arrhythmia. So if you are lucky enough to survive a sudden cardiac arrest, no further questions asked, you would really benefit from a defibrillator. We call this, a, that's a class one recommendation. It's the highest level of recommendation that we have. And then there are other uh, criteria. If you have a family history of sudden cardiac death, in a first degree relative who died at a relatively early age, before the age of 50, or if you have multiple family members who have died, or if you have an episode of syncope, which is an episode of passing out, where we suspect this was not an episode of passing out because you got up too quickly. This was not an episode of passing out because you were dehydrated, but it happened like you flip a light switch. It was happened without any warning signs. And we call this an arrhythmogenic syncope. That is very, um, that's a criteria to consider an ICD. We know that if your heart is, if your heart muscle is very thick, so normally it would be about a centimeter, but we know if the wall of the left main pumping chamber exceeds more than three centimeters, that's also a criteria which increases your risk of arrhythmia significantly. If you have a left ventricular apical aneurysm, which is an outpouching of the, at the apex of the heart, your risk of arrhythmias increases fivefold. Likewise, if you have a heart function that is anything but normal, if you have a heart function that is reduced, you also are at higher risk of developing life-threatening arrhythmias. And if you meet any of those five criteria, we think that a defibrillator is certainly reasonable and the benefits by far outweigh the risks of implantation of or living with a defibrillator. And then there are uh, several minor risk factors, which we call risk modifiers. 
That is, if you have scar on your cardiac MRI, if you have non-sustained ventricular tachycardia, so brief runs of those um, potentially dangerous rhythms on a 24, 48 hour EKG, or if you're very young, we know that um, the older you get, and if you live to the age of 80 with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, you can assume that your risk of benefiting from a defibrillator is less rather than if you're 20 years old and you have uh, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. So those minor risk factors, we say, well, and indeed, um, a defibrillator may be reasonable, but the benefits are a little bit less clear. Um, the benefits of a defibrillator with only minor risk factors is uncertain. So what kind of tests do we need to do to assess the risk of cardiac deaths? Well, the first three, they're really simple. You, you can just get that by talking to the patient and getting a good history and a good family history. That is really important for patients who have hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. And then there are criteria like the thickening of the heart muscle, to see whether this outpouching at the apex of the heart is present, whether the heart function is reduced, or whether there's scar in the cardiac MRI. All those criteria are based on cardiac imaging. You can get that with echo or with cardiac MRI. Now, to look for scar on cardiac MRI, to look for scar, you really need a cardiac MRI. You cannot see that on the echocardiogram. And the last is, is you, you need an ambulatory EKG monitor. So a 24 hour or 48 hour EKG. As you can see, um, genetic testing is important for the diagnosis of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, but it's really not required to determine whether a patient needs an ICD or not. It's an evolving field and there seem to be some mutations that are um, more prone to develop or patients with certain mutations that are more prone to develop those life-threatening arrhythmias, but it's not established in the guidelines at this time. So you could ask why, if there is a risk of sudden cardiac death, and if the consequence of sudden cardiac death is obviously so severe, why does not every patient with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy get an ICD? Well, there are sev several surgical risks of the implantation procedure itself. There's a risk of bleeding. There's a small risk of infection, of injury to a blood vessel, injury to the heart. There can be a partial collapse of the lung. That's usually reversible, but a prolonged hospitalization. There can be a dislodgement of the ICD. And very rarely, there is a risk, like with any surgical procedure, from the anesthesia or the procedure itself of, of a more severe complication and death. Um, and importantly, there are long-term risks. Um, if you live with a defibrillator or any kind of implanted cardiac device, there's always a risk of infection or erosion of the device. There's a risk of lead failure, premature battery depletion. Those are little computers with the batteries and they can malfunction. And there, is, there can be the need for repeat procedures. The longevity of the ICD is usually anywhere between six and 12 years after the battery um, is running low, you need to have that uh, generator replaced. And the most significant for patients is that there is a risk of what we call inappropriate ICD shocks. This is when a patient gets an ICD shock where actually, when the patient should not have gotten an ICD shock. And if you get an ICD shock when you're awake, that can be a very painful experience. And for many patients, that can lead to anxiety and even uh, PTSD symptoms. And one of the most common reasons to get inappropriate ICD shocks, my colleague Dr. Crispin will discuss in his next talk, and this is atrial fibrillation. And this is why it's important to consider not only ventricular arrhythmias, but also atrial arrhythmias in patients who have hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. So what are, restric what are the restrictions um, when you have an ICD? Importantly, there are some professional restrictions. Restriction. So if you're an airline pilot, uh, your career is, is over. If you're a professional driver, a truck driver or a bus driver, you're not allowed to um, uh, drive professionally anymore. Uh, personal driving is permitted as long as you don't have any uh, shocks from the device. Likewise, if you work on construction sites and you're an arc welder, there can be electromagnetic interference that's picked up by the ICD from the arc welding, and that can lead to inappropriate shock, and that's important to consider. Now, the novel ICDs, they are very well shielded now for any kind of electromagnetic interference. 
And actually, you can get even cardiac MRI or any kind of MRI with an ICD nowadays. And they are labeled by the FDA as MRI conditional or MRI compatible, but it still requires a special MRI protocol. So it's not that you can go and have an MRI the next day. There needs to be somebody there to check the device, to check the ICD before you go into the MRI and after you come out of the MRI. But it's certainly doable nowadays. And another question that we frequently get, are there any restrictions with respect to exercise with an ICD? And importantly, you should avoid contact sports. That's probably more important for younger patients with HCM. However, regular exercise is encouraged with uh, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, but that's always an individual discussion um, with your uh, provider. And there was always the risk, and there will be a special um, session later on, uh, whether the risk of sudden cardiac death is higher with exercise. And this is a study that looked across different age groups. And what, we, what was found was that the death was more frequent at rest than with exercise. So as expected, younger patients tend to be more active and you see a higher rate of um, death that occurred during exercise. But on average, death at rest is by far more frequent than death uh, uh, during exercise. So to summarize, patients with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy are prone to develop fatal ventricular arrhythmias. And sudden cardiac death is the most feared complication of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. And it is important to evaluate for those sudden cardiac death risk factors. And that is really a standard of care. It should occur during annual visits or with any change of symptoms. So I tell patients, whenever you develop an episode of passing out, please let me know, let your provider know. Don't assume that this is just an episode of dehydration or an episode where you got up too quickly. Let us know, let us reevaluate you and determine whether anything has changed in the course of your disease. And if we determine that you're at high risk patients, ICD is the best available therapy. And I haven't talked much about medications. We know that medications are in, imperfect to prevent the risk of sudden cardiac death. There are medications that can be used as uh, an adjunct, so in combination with defibrillators, or you may, it may be determined if you have ICD shocks that you may need medications plus an ablation, but the cornerstone remains the cardiac defibrillator. And I'll stop here and I'll uh, pass on to my colleague, Dr. Crispin, who will discuss uh, atrial arrhythmias. Thank you for your attention. All right, thank you, Dr. Barth. Uh, so uh, thank you for all for your attention. And over the next uh, few minutes, we'll be talking about atrial arrhythmias in hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. In Pacific, we'll talk about atrial fibrillation, which is the most common type of arrhythmia um, in the world, uh, particularly those with atrial fibrillation. So what is atrial fibrillation or AFib? It is uh, caused by rapid and uncoordinated logical impulses from the upper chambers of the heart. Here, we're looking at a little figure of the heart. These two top chambers here are called the atria. And within the atrium, when somebody goes into atrial fibrillation, it beats about 400, 450 beats per minute. Fortunately, your heart has a normal braking system here called the AV node, but these impulses travel down to the ventricles or the main pumping chambers of the heart. And this causes a rapid and irregular heart rhythm. As I mentioned, this is the most common arrhythmia. It affects more than 5 million people in the United States. And many times individuals are symptomatic. And some of those symptoms include things like palpitations or feeling like the heart is fluttering, shortness of breath and fatigue are very common complaints or symptoms that individuals have. So atrial fibrillation is a product of aging. We know based on a number of prospective registries that as we get older, the incidence of atrial fibrillation increases exponentially. Actually, by the time one reaches the age of 85, there's a one in four chance if you have had an episode of atrial fibrillation. And so here on the left, looking at a graph of the overall um, US population, but the same is true for hypertrophic cardiomyopathy as well, whereas the age increases, 
the incidence of individuals who have atrial fibrillation increases as well. The one thing that's different is that individuals with HCM seem to develop atrial fibrillation at a much earlier age. So here, uh, this is based on a large prospective uh, registry showing that the, the peak uh, age of when someone develops their first episode of atrial fibrillation was in their 50s within this uh, group of individuals with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. And the overall prevalence of atrial fibrillation in ACM is estimated to be about 20%, which honestly is probably under um, estimating the true prevalence in this population. So why do you develop atrial fibrillation? Well, atrial fibrillation is a pretty complex rhythm disorder. Um, the common things are, are age. So once again, as we get older, the incidence of atrial fibrillation increases. Particular to hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, especially those who have outflow tract obstruction, this leads to increased pressure within the left ventricle and subsequently the left atrium. Um, and that leads to changes to the heart itself. And particularly, we'll talk more about this, is the left atrium. This is a place where about 90 to 95% of the triggers of atrial fibrillation arises from. When uh, as that obstruction increases, it develops, someone develops valvular heart disease, or because of the thickness of the heart muscle itself, at least increased pressure in the left atrium. This leads to uh, dilatation or um, the dilation of the left atrium that results in scarring of the left atrium. And we know based on a number of different imaging studies that the more scar you have in your left atrium, the more likely you are to have um, atrial fibrillation. And consistently throughout all the different uh, studies and uh, registries shows that age, left atrial size, so how big the left atrium is, as well as the function, so how well is the left atrium squeezing and pumping, are all the strongest risk factors for development of atrial fibrillation. So why is, is this clinically important? So there's two main sort of consequences we worry about with somebody who goes with atrial fibrillation, particularly if they have hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. One is worsening heart failure symptoms. So here we're looking at a cardiac MRI in a patient who has hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. Here, um, looking at um, with my laser poison here is the left ventricle. And I'll tell you that this wall within the left ventricle is very thick because this person has HCM. Here is the left atrium. And as you can see here in this individual, the left atrium is very dilated. It's almost, it's, the cavity is almost as big as the left ventricle itself. And when you go into atrial fibrillation, there's loss of a coordinated contraction of the atrium with the ventricle. Once again, you then develop very fast heart rates and at least an inefficient contraction of the left ventricle, which is the main pumping chamber of the heart. And individuals who also have obstruction, so left ventricular outflow tract obstruction, where there's impaired blood flow from the left ventricle to the rest of the heart, when you go into atrial fibrillation, this could lead to compromise of the blood flow to the rest of your body, resulting in things like low blood pressures, feeling of lightheadedness, and in some situations, particularly when you're very dehydrated, um, syncope or, or passing out. The second biggest clinical uh, impact is a term we call thromboembolism or clots that embolize from the heart itself to the rest of the body with the most worrisome being strokes, so clots that originate in the heart and then travel to the brain. So the incidence of thromboembolism is about 3.8% per year in individuals with HCM. Uh, the incidence of stroke is eight times more frequent in HCM patients uh, with atrial fibrillation compared to those who do not. Um, and so that's why it's really important that HCM patients, even with a single episode of atrial fibrillation that lasts more than five minutes, should be treated with long-term blood thinners. So here we're looking at uh, a transesophageal echocardiogram, so an ultrasound of the heart. What we're looking at here is the left atrium. So once again, the left atrium is really kind of the most important chamber related to atrial fibrillation. And when you go into atrial fibrillation, because your heart atrium is being so fast, you're not getting an adequate contraction of the chamber itself. That leads to pooling of the blood, particularly in the part of the left atrium called the left atrial appendage, which I'm sort of highlighting here. And within this left atrial appendage in this patient who is in atrial fibrillation, we see this density here in the appendage itself. This is a clot that's inside of the heart. So the concern is that this clot could break off, travel to the ventricles and then to the rest of the heart. And so it's really important that um, anybody with HCM, and we'll talk about some of the, the guideline criteria, should be on a blood thinner. 
Um, and this is different compared to the general atrial fibrillation population, where typically we would use a scoring system termed the CHADS VAS score. So you may hear if you're somebody you know who has atrial fibrillation, you may have heard of this CHADS VAS score uh, that encompasses things like history of heart failure, your age, whether you have diabetes um, or previous strokes. But that does not apply to people with HCM, um, uh, the CHADS VAS score. So then how do we screen, how do we detect atrial fibrillation? There's um, some discrepancy previously in the guidelines. So the European guidelines initially were, were very aggressive in terms of uh, screening for atrial fibrillation. And their recommendation was for 48 hour ECG monitor every six to 12 months in any HCM patient with an enlarged left atrium. And this was a, a, was a class 2A recommendation. Dr. Barth talked about the different levels of recommendations. Class one being it should probably always be performed. 2A is right below that, where it's reasonable to perform this. The American guidelines previously were actually less rigorous. So the previous guidelines would say that you can consider a ECG monitor and electrocardiogram monitor for 24 hours uh, individuals with an enlarged left atrium. And it was only given a class 2B recommendation, so not a very strong level of recommendation. This has changed with the most up-to-date um, American uh, AHA, ATC, HCM guidelines that was published uh, just last year. Um, and it's actually a lot more uh, strict in terms of its screening recommendations. So now the American guidelines would say that an extended ECG monitor is reasonable in adults with an enlarged left atrium and other risk factors every one to two years. And now this was uh, elevated to a class two-way recommendation. And you know it, it is important. I you know I do think personally that um, this still may um, underestimate the true um, incidence and prevalence of atrial fibrillation because atrial fibrillation often is what we term proxismal, meaning that it comes and goes. So if you only wear a monitor for 24 or 48 hours, more than likely you probably will be missing episodes of atrial fibrillation. So longer term rhythm monitoring, usually at least for two weeks. Sometimes we even do it for longer with implantable loop of monitors that can last up to three years. I think it will be more um, important, especially if you have a lot of risk factors. And nowadays, especially with mobile health technology, I mean, it's not an ad for these companies, but things like an Apple Watch or a live core monitor allows for more personalized screening at home. So now with just your watch or a little monitor connects to your smartphone, if you have symptoms of feeling your heart's racing or something like that, you're able to kind of quickly get an EKG at home. So I think we'll be seeing a lot more um, diagnosis of atrial fibrillation in individuals with HCM. So what do we do once you're diagnosed with atrial fibrillation? There are two principles uh, in terms of management. One, and I think it really is the most important because this is what's really kind of associated with uh, decline in quality of life is stroke prevention with blood thinners. And not with things like aspirin. Aspirin is not an adequate blood thinner for stroke prevention for atrial fibrillation, but much stronger blood thinners. Um, there, one is a class called direct um, oral anticoagulants, um, and uh, alternatively, something was uh, older medications, something was called warfarin. But uh, being on a blood thinner is really kind of the key. And in this figure, what we're seeing is that individuals who are on anticoagulation uh, with a history of atrial fibrillation have a similar stroke rate compared to individuals who don't have atrial fibrillation. So here in blue, we see individuals who have atrial fibrillation who are not on blood thinners. And you can see their incidence over time um, for uh, strokes. Here in green are individuals with atrial fibrillation who are on blood thinners. And in red are individuals who don't have atrial fibrillation. So being on a blood thinner decreases your risk of stroke down to the level of somebody who does not have atrial fibrillation. Nobody has a zero risk of a stroke, um, but this I think is a very powerful sort of data supporting the use of blood thinners uh, with the history of individuals with atrial fibrillation. And then second principle is symptom alleviation. Um, HCM patients are very symptomatic often with atrial fibrillation. It's not uncommon for people who don't have HCM to actually to not even know they sometimes have atrial fibrillation, but uh, for a number of different hemodynamic um, uh, factors, people with HCM are very symptomatic often with their atrial fibrillation. So how do we manage them? 
there are two overarching strategies. One is something we call rate control. And rate control means that, well, we don't really care if you go into atrial fibrillation or not. We're just gonna make sure that your heart rate is not going too fast. So we don't want your heart rate to be going at 110, 120 beats per minute. We're gonna give you medications. And basically there's two classes of medications called beta blockers and calcium channel blockers are there to slow the heart rate down. The other strategy, and now uh, this is actually the preferred strategy, something what's called rhythm control. And rhythm control says that we're gonna do things to keep you in normal rhythm. There's evidence in a general population where we say, where it's been found that keeping people in normal rhythm may decrease things like strokes, may decrease heart failure. Um, and so we kind of prefer a rhythm control strategy, especially for someone who was first initially diagnosed with atrial fibrillation. And the ways to do that are one with something that's called a cardioversion. A cardioversion is somebody who is in, stuck in, or in persistent atrial fibrillation where we literally shock the heart back into a normal rhythm. This is actually a very safe and very common procedure that we do to get people back into a normal rhythm. Often though, we need to do more than that. And there's either drug options. So what we call anti-arrhythmic drugs, things like sotolol, amiodarone are kind of two very common types of drugs that we use uh, individual with the ACM for atrial fibrillation. And then for those who don't want to be on drugs or who have failed drug therapy, um, then there's a more invasive options. One is uh, catheter ablation. This is a procedure that nowadays actually is done as an outpatient. Um, a lot of times we're actually sending people home the same day. And what we do under anesthesia is we go to the left atrium here and we go to a part of the heart called the pulmonary veins, which is a very common source for triggers of atrial fibrillation. And using either heat or freezing energy, we go ahead and ablate that part of the heart. And this has been shown to improve outcomes related to atrial fibrillation. It is important that we do this early in the course, or at least before things change in terms of the heart function itself. Here in this figure is the data from patients with HCM who are undergoing catheter ablation procedure. And what it's highlighting is that, that outcomes in terms of how likely are you to stay in normal rhythm is dependent on how big that left atrium size is. So if your left atrium is small, your outcomes are very good. But if the left atrium is, gets big and dilated, then the outcomes from an ablation procedure are a lot worse. So this is kind of more just evidence saying that we should be intervening earlier to kind of keep individuals in normal rhythm before structural changes happen to the left atrium. Because no matter what we do, whether it's with drugs or with ablation procedures, um, the outcomes are just not as good. And then for those who have left ventricular output tract obstruction, um, who are undergoing a surgical myectomy, which Dr. Gammy is going to talk about a little bit later, then it's actually a, a pretty strong recommendation to do a, a surgical ablation at the time of the myectomy. And then finally, once again, I'm uh, you know, harp on this, anticoagulation is really important for everyone unless you have a serious bleeding uh, complication on a blood thinner. And the preferred agents are some of the, the not necessarily newer now, but uh, the novels, uh, uh, blood thinners that you see here are the preferred blood thinners to be on when you have atrial fibrillation. For those who, for some reason, can't be on these um, drugs, then warfarin would be a second line agent. And then finally, the long-term outcomes actually are pretty good for individuals who are appropriately treated for their atrial fibrillation. So this is actually the, the largest study of, of over 1,500 patients with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy who are followed at uh, one of the major ACM centers. Um, and what they showed is that if you're diagnosed with atrial fibrillation and you're appropriately treated, meaning that you're on your blood thinners, you're getting appropriate medications or ablation procedures for management of your atrial fibrillation, then your risk of dying early or having heart failure is similar whether you have atrial fibrillation or not. So what we're seeing in this graph here in the solid black line are individuals with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy who will have atrial fibrillation. And here in the dotted line are HCM patients without atrial fibrillation. And you see there's no difference in long-term outcomes for people, once again, I'll emphasize the point that are on appropriate treatment for their atrial fibrillation. And the same holds true uh, for um, heart failure, um, hospitalizations and symptoms. So conclusion, you know, atrial fibrillation is common in patients with HCM. 
it is important to recognize the symptoms that are associated with these atrial fibrillation. So if you start feeling that your heart's fluttering, you feel more tired than usual, you feel more short of breath, you know, these are important sort of symptoms to talk to your physician about and that more screening can be done to kind of figure out whether what you're feeling is due to an arrhythmia. Stroke prevention is with blood thinners is key. And given a poor tolerance of atrial fibrillation and HDM, the strategy to maintain normal sinus rhythm is preferred. And thank you for your time. And I'll pass it on to, uh, to Dr. Han to talk about heart failure in HCM. Good evening, everyone. Thank you for this opportunity to talk with all of you about heart failure in patients with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. So we're going to first talk about the definition and diagnosis of heart, fa heart failure in patients with HCM. And then we will talk about the prevalence. The good news is that most patients with HCM never develop heart failure. Um, we will talk about risk factors, prognosis once heart failure is diagnosed, and how we manage these patients. And then subsequently, I'll talk about advanced heart failure, uh, which is when the heart failure is so severe and not responsive to medications and devices. Um, that we have to think about advanced options like mechanical heart pumps and heart transplantation. So first, heart failure in HCM is really defined by the left ventricular ejection fraction being below uh, 50% as Dr. Barth introduced. So in patients with HCM, um, any reduction in the left ventricular ejection fraction is concerning and it leads to a change in management. Um, this, this diagnosis of heart failure is referred to with several different names in the literature, um, sometimes called burned out HCM, sometimes called end stage HCM. I think the most accurate is HCM with left ventricular systolic dysfunction. And the ejection fraction is simply the amount of blood pumped out of the heart um, in systole when the heart squeezes, um, divided by the amount of blood that it started with at the end of diastole when the heart relaxes. Uh, so first, how many patients with HCM will get this disease? So I told you that the good news is that the prevalence is quite low. So there are only five to 8% of patients with HCM that will develop reduced uh, left ventricular ejection fraction. That means 92 to 95% of patients will not develop um, heart failure or LV systolic dysfunction. Um, so the risk factors for heart failure with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy include um, family history of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, including uh, or especially patients who have family history of reduced um, left ventricular ejection fraction HCM patients who have um, more scar on their cardiac MRI, patients who have lower left ventricular ejection fraction at diagnosis. So in patients with HCM, this means um, even having ejection fraction less than 60%, um, and patients who have more severe symptoms of heart failure at diagnosis. Um, initial studies um, and smaller studies uh, reported that there was no connection with um, pathogenic variants and the development of LV dysfunction. However, um, in the SHARE registry, which is one of the largest studies of patients with HCM, um, they found that there was a connection between pathogenic variants, especially in patients who had multiple variants or variants in the thin filament. Um, of note, Patients who had septal reduction in therapy like alcohol septal ab ablation or um, septal myectomy uh, did not have an increased risk of um, development of heart failure. And how about the prognosis? So depending on how you define um, what the bad outcomes are, 
25 to 50% will stabilize with medications and other therapies. Um, the first thing that we need to do when a patient um, is diagnosed with reduced LV ejection fraction is that we have to rule out other causes of heart failure. Um, we have had plenty of patients who had HCM, but then on top of that developed coronary artery disease or blockages in the heart arteries that caused reduced ejection fraction. And that's very, very important because that is treated differently. Um, and then patients uh, with heart failure and HCM will be started on typical heart failure medications. We now have four pillars of heart failure therapy, and they include beta blockers, um, ACE inhibitors, ARBs, or um, ARNIs, and um, mineralocorticoid antagonists, and then the new medications, which are sodium glucose um, co-transporter inhibitors. And then very commonly um, diuretics. And frequently our patients with heart failure and HCM have very stiff hearts and will require high doses of diuretics um, to keep fluid from accumulating in their bodies. And then as Dr. Barth mentioned, all patients who have a left ventricular ejection fraction under 50% um, need to um, talk with their physician about a defibrillator because this, they are at higher risk of um, sudden cardiac death. And then cardiac resynchronization therapy is a special type of um, pacemaker that is coupled with a defibrillator in people who need that, um, where both sides of the heart are paced at the same time. Um, and this is only indicated in certain patients, um, but patients with HCM are eligible for this therapy if it is indicated. So what if medications and devices are not enough? Then what do we have to offer our patients? Um, then we think about advanced therapy evaluation. And this is really for patients who have um, refractory symptoms that are severe. Uh, we use this New York Heart Association um, heart failure classification to um, classify symptoms. So in patients who have class three or four symptoms, which means that they're really only um, comfortable at rest um, or even may have symptoms at rest. Um, and these symptoms generally include shortness of breath, lightheadedness or dizziness, um, fatigue, leg swelling, and um, often abdominal symptoms of bloating or feeling full after eating. Um, and these symptoms can be due to a weak heart. Um, sometimes we also see this. So in general, the patients who have a weak heart with HCM, um, the heart is stiff as well. Um, but sometimes we even see patients who have a normal ejection fraction who have a very stiff heart develop these symptoms. Um, and then also patients can have these symptoms from severe obstruction, particularly if they have failed um, medicines and procedures to improve the obstruction. So what are advanced heart failure therapies? So generally there are two options. One are mechanical heart pumps or left ventricular assist devices, and the other is heart transplantation. Um, contraindications or reasons why somebody could not get either of these therapies would be severe problems with other organs um, that would make either operation uh, or management of either condition, very high risk. High blood pressure in the lungs is a contraindication for heart transplantation because it leads to failure of the new heart. Um, and a weak right ventricle or a small heart is a contraindication for the LVAD. There are other relative contraindications. Um, the evaluation for either of these therapies is quite extensive. Um, and requires discussion amongst the LVAD transplant team and also with the patient. Uh, so I'll talk a little bit more about left ventricular assist devices. So there are mechanical heart pumps that sit inside the body and basically draws blood from the pumping chamber of the heart, which is the left ventricle. And then there is a mechanical um, battery operated pump here that then pumps the blood to the main artery, uh, which is called the aorta. Uh, 
there is a, um, a tube here that is connected to an external battery. Um, so companies are currently working on um, a fully implantable heart pump, but at this point there is a tube that connects to the batteries that patients basically wear. Um, and there's many YouTube videos you can find of people being very active with these devices um, and have, having a very um, good quality of life. Um, but it is true that you will need to be connected to a battery. The median survival um, currently is about, five, or based on several years ago, is about five years, but is improving with newer pumps. Um, and we've had new pumps come out um, every few years and it looks like our newest pump, which is the HeartMate 3, has improved survival and um, less um, complications than the prior two. Uh, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy remains a rare indication for an LVAD. So less than 1% of VADs were performed for hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. But the good news is that their survival was similar to patients who had LVADs for other reasons. Um, with the exception of patients who had a small heart, which I, I noted in the slide before, um, is a contraindication uh, or relative contraindication for this procedure. And next we'll talk about heart transplantation. So we do in the United States about 3,500 heart transplants per year. And this number has increased over the past um, decade. It, uh, I think, People can probably envision what this looks like, but essentially the diseased heart is removed from the body and a donor heart is um, placed inside the body in the same position. Um, heart transplantation has um, median survival of about 10 years, um, but this can vary widely. So we certainly have patients who are living with heart transplants more than 30 years later. HCM is a rare indication for heart transplantation as it is for LVAD. So about 1% of transplants are performed in patients with HCM. And the great news is that the outcomes for these patients are the same or maybe even better compared to patients with other forms of heart failure. Um, both of the therapies do have um, complications. And so that's why we only do these therapies or do these surgeries and these procedures when it's indicated, as you've heard from other providers, um, but they remain excellent options for those who need them. So in summary, most patients with HCM never develop left ventricular systolic dysfunction, but those who do have several options for therapy, including medications, devices, and procedures and mechanical heart pumps and heart transplantation remain excellent options for patients with HCM who need them. Thank you very much. All right, good evening. Um, I would like to talk about a couple of uh, important topics in counseling. I'm going to start out with exercise and participation in sports. Um, and it is a little bit of a confusing or hard to counsel uh, topic at times, uh, particularly if you're a long uh, standing HCM patient, you may hear different recommendations that have evolved over time. So, what I thought I'd do is give a little bit of a historical perspective of where the guidelines were uh, before and how we got to where we are now. So prior to now, we had our late, latest uh, version of the guidelines back in 2011. And at that time, uh, there was very little data to guide what to do in terms of exercise counseling. Um, the most recent guidelines were published in 2020 or fall of 2020. So in between the 2011 and 2020 guidelines, there were several studies looking at exercise in HCM populations, which impacted the 2020 guidelines. So let's go back to 2011 before that data was available. 
Um, and what we knew then, as Dr. Barth <laughs> had mentioned, is that um, HCM is the number one cause of unexplained uh, death or sudden death in young athletes. So here's a study looking at about 2,000 athletes in the United States, uh, young people. So this is a devastating problem when it happens um, over about a 30 year period. We can see that in uh, white or non-white patients, about 10 to 20% of the athletes that died suddenly had HCM as a cause of death. Here's another uh, interesting uh, tidbit to look at. So these are famous uh, athletes that have died with H uh, that have died suddenly, sorry. We can see that a fair number of them have HCM. So not only is it a devastating problem uh, in young patients, but also potentially a very visible problem when we have these major league players uh, dying suddenly with these conditions. So back in 2011, knowing that HCM was the most common cause of sudden death in young athletes, and that it's a very visible problem, the recommendation was really that this is a class three or it's harmful uh, for patients with HCM to participate in competitive sports or in intense non-competitive uh, vigorous activities. And this was kind of a blanket statement regardless of age, sex, race, uh, presence or absence of obstruction, et cetera. Uh, it was very um, conservative in the recommendation for exercise and athletic activities. They did make the caveat that in certain select patients that are at lower risk, 1A activities, which are depicted here, uh, were potentially reasonable. So things like bowling, uh, golf, uh, yoga, for example in your lower risk patients. Um, they also provided that table that is uh, still sometimes useful, showing uh, low, moderate, and high intensity activities and a scale of, uh, from zero to five, uh, with five being the safest and zero being the least safe, showing what things could be done. Uh, so for example, um, you know, golf gets a five, so very safe. Uh, but, you know, uh, playing uh, basketball where you're sprinting quickly and uh, having burst activities would get a zero or at least safe. Okay, so that's um, where we were with 2011 uh, and 2011 guidelines. So if you're an HCM patient, particularly if you've had it for a long time, uh, you've probably heard to refrain from all competitive sports and to uh, take it very easy with the types of activities you do daily. Um, but you may also be confused because here we are now, and uh, here's an article that came out about uh, Jared Butler, an NBA player. So now we have somebody with HCM that uh, knows he has the condition, that the league knows he has the condition, and that has been allowed to play basketball, which was previously thought to be the least safe of activities, at a high professional level. So clearly uh, the HCM uh, community has made a change in how we view exercise and um, we'll get to some of that. So um, coming back to this table uh, where I showed you famous people um, that died of different conditions and HCM being a common one, one thing to observe here is that HCM is a lot more common than some of these other conditions. Okay, so HCM is an order of magnitude more common than these other conditions. So if this is way more common, it's expected that we're gonna see more events happen in a common disease compared to in rare diseases. Um, we also uh, have observed, as Dr. Uh, Barth also mentioned, that most sudden death events in patients with HCM actually happen during rest, not during activity. Okay? So yes, we see that in young athletes that die suddenly, HCM is the most common cause, but most sudden death in HCM doesn't happen during activity. And then very importantly, we've talked about different management strategies, uh, things like implanting defibrillators, uh, septal modification therapies when needed, heart transplantation, um, and again, using all these modern technologies, 
the life expectancy of most HCM patients is similar to that of the general population. So what that means is most HCM patients will age normally. And therefore, if they're sedentary and they don't exercise, they will be at risk for the diseases that the general population is at risk for, things like obesity, diabetes, and cholesterol buildup in your arteries, which can lead to heart attacks and strokes. So we want to prevent these things from happening. So over that time period between 2011 and the 2020 guidelines, there were several trials looking at exercise, low, moderate, and high intensity exercise and select a group of patients with HCM, mostly observational studies, but some of them were randomized trials. And they showed uh, that exercise is safe and beneficial in select HCM patients. I do want to still emphasize the select HCM patient part of things, because when we do counseling, uh, we have uh, uh, you know, sparse data to guide us, but we also have to tailor it to each individual HCM patient. So we cannot give blanket uh, recommendations that apply to everybody. So I'm gonna take one of these studies, uh, the RESET HCM trial, and just show you a little bit more information. This is our one randomized controlled trial looking at HCM, uh, but let's break it down into what it means and so we can understand what some of the limitations of taking this uh, at face value without knowing a little bit more. So first of all, 30% um, of the patients that they tried to enroll in this trial met exclusion criteria, okay? So not all comers could just be put into these exercise programs, right? A third of people did not qualify because they had some either high-risk features or features that they found were not acceptable to be entered into the uh, study. Second observation is that within the HCM population, <clears throat> uh, these patients were generally not those that have had arrhythmias, uh, only a third of them had ICDs, so they didn't have the high-risk features for sudden death that Dr. Barth talked about. Um, and most of them uh, did not have obstruction at rest. So only 17% had resting obstruction. And if we look at the uh, overall gradients here, we mentioned uh, during part one of the seminar that we define obstruction at rest as greater than 30 millimeters of mercury or with provocation usually it takes 50 millimeters of mercury to explain symptoms. So these were not very obstructive patients, okay? So once you met the selection criteria, then they got put into an exercise program, which consisted mainly of cycling, uh, walk-jog protocols, elliptical training. Uh, there wasn't uh, a strength activity or burst type activity included in here, and they did 20-minute sessions. Uh, with a way to calculate some uh, target heart rate. So again, it is important to say that it is beneficial for HCM patients to exercise. Uh, it was safe, uh, but we did select specific patients that could perform these exercise activities and did not allow other high-risk patients to perform uh, these activities. So with that, uh, information, the 2020 guidelines have changed. And so now we're saying in most patients with HCM, mild to moderate recreational exercise is beneficial, okay? We still have to be uh, careful with competitive sports. Uh, most patients with HCM can participate in those low intensity competitive sports that I showed before. And then for select patients with HCM, uh, with a mutual uh, decision-making and mutual informed consent, uh, also with participation of external agencies, some select patients may still be able to participate in high-intensity competitive sports. Okay, so significant change in the guidelines. And one thing that does come up occasionally uh, is people ask, uh, well, how about if I get a defibrillator placed just so I can do sports? And that is generally not recommended. That's a class three recommendation. We would not put a defibrillator in just to allow somebody to participate in sports. So just to wrap up, uh, what does this mean for you when we talk about light or moderate intensity exercise? Um, what we uh, 
do or classify this as is to take the number 220 minus the patient's age, and that's your maximum predicted heart rate. Um, so moderate intensity would be 50 to 70% of that maximum predicted heart rate number, whereas greater than 70% of that number is considered vigorous exercise. So as an example, if you're 40 years old, 220 minus 40 is 180. So 40 to 50% of 180 would correspond to a target heart rate in the 70 to 90 range. Moderate would correspond to a heart rate in the 90 to about 130 range. And once you start getting above 130, that's considered vigorous and you may wanna start toning down your activity level. So I hope that that is helpful um, and I will pass on counseling uh, to Dr. Uh, Minhas, who is our chief fellow, and she is heavily involved in our cardio obstetrics clinic. She will be talking about HCM and pregnancy. And once again, I want to thank the Leibowitz family and the Talis Fund for their support uh, in the HCM program's research efforts and our outreach efforts. Thank you very much. Uh, Dr. Minhas, I will pass it on to you. Thank you, Dr. Madrazo. Good evening, everybody. It's my pleasure to welcome you to this um, discussion on pregnancy considerations with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. So it's important to realize that during pregnancy, women are going through multiple, multiple changes. So let's take uh, as an example here, the amount Of so pregnancy, as most of us know, three trimesters or three phases, and near the end of pregnancy, blood pressure starts going up. The amount of work that a normal healthy heart must do for pregnancy is about 50% more than what it does when a woman is not pregnant. And then immediately at the time of delivery, about half a liter of blood immediately comes back to the heart. Um, and women's hearts are expected to compensate for that or they will run into trouble. And I mention these things because when we're talking about women who have hypertrophic cardiomyopathy and what sort of things they might expect when they're pregnant, it's helpful to realize that all women when pregnant are expected to have these cardiac changes for a normal healthy pregnancy. And if a woman has advanced heart failure, for instance, because she has hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, she might have trouble um, during pregnancy for these reasons. And then in particular, blood pressure matters a lot for our patients with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, because if the blood pressure drops too much um, for women with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, they could potentially get into a little bit of trouble. Um, when they're pregnant. Now, the good news is that overall, women who have hypertrophic cardiomyopathy actually do quite well in pregnancy. And in general, we do not tell women that have hypertrophic cardiomyopathy that they cannot be pregnant or that they cannot have um, assisted reproduction if that's what they need to become pregnant. In general, most women with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy will do just fine, as will their babies. And anytime we're talking about how to take care of our patients in medicine, we're relying on large studies that have been done. Um, there's not you know, a lot of women that have been through pregnancy with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy simply because it's just um, not as common as we would think. But there was the largest study in this particular area tells us there were 30, 60 women that were studied from 19 different countries um, looking at cardiac complications during pregnancy. And these are just uh, graphs here that tell us what sort of complications could potentially occur. Now, again, very reassuringly, in this study, there were no maternal deaths. Um, and really, there are not very many maternal deaths reported at all. So um, most women can expect to survive through pregnancy um, with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy without it being a big life-threatening concern. Now, there are some cardiac complications that can come up. So in the first trimester at the start of the pregnancy, it's unusual to have too many cardiac complications. And that's because those changes that are expected of the heart tend to be a lot less at the very start of pregnancy. But if anything, it, you know, a few women, less than 10%, 
had some heart failure or some arrhythmias from the bottom chambers of the heart or ventricular tachyarrhythmias. Now in the second trimester and really the third trimester, the third trimester is where the expectation is the highest for the heart to have to increase the amount of work that it does to handle all of the extra volume. There's a greater risk for ventricular arrhythmias or bad heart rhythms coming from the bottom chambers of the heart as well as for heart failure. So that's the red and the blue. With almost um, 40 to 50% of women potentially having these complications. And then again, in the first week postpartum, immediately that goes down. There's really no heart rhythm problems that were reported in the study after baby was delivered, uh, but there is a little bit more of a likelihood of having heart failure. And that's because of that immediate shift um, of blood coming back to the heart and then having to compensate again with the baby being out, the placenta being out and then recovering from pregnancy. So what might predict how a woman might do when she's pregnant with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy? So really what I'm trying to highlight here is that women with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy are more likely to have cardiac complications with pregnancy if they had cardiac complications coming into pregnancy. So women that were not functioning completely normally as in women that might've been more likely to need water pills to, uh, to keep off fluid, or those women that weren't able to exercise normally because they were getting short of breath, um, those are the women that are more likely to have complications with pregnancy. Um, women that actually were doing very well before pregnancy tend to do very well throughout pregnancy. And we heard a little bit earlier about obstructive versus non-obstructive cardiomyopathy. So that means is your hypertrophic cardiomyopathy causing a problem such that blood is not able to get out of the heart appropriately? So when we look at that, and a lot of patients with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy become very familiar with the term gradient, what does the echo show, the ultrasound of the heart, what's the gradient that's being measured, at least for pregnancy, that does not seem to play a fact. Um, that doesn't really seem to matter so much. And women that have higher gradients generally do the same as women that had no gradient during pregnancy. And that's because of all of these changes that are um, happening during pregnancy. A lot of those changes actually help women with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, like having the extra blood volume. And then whenever we're thinking about pregnancy, we're always thinking about the baby and also the obstetric complications. So when a woman is pregnant, we're also mindful of other complications that could happen related to just the pregnancy. So things like preeclampsia, which means high blood pressure during pregnancy, hemorrhage or bleeding, miscarriage, death of the baby, a small baby, preterm birth or baby being born prematurely, um, and then the weight of the baby, are really not that different actually, reassuringly in women that have hypertrophic cardiomyopathy with any cardiac problems or without. So in general, most women with hypertrophic cardiomyopathies will be fine from a cardiac standpoint, from a baby standpoint, and then also from an obstetric standpoint. But they might be more likely to have a cesarean section compared to a woman that did not have hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. So our guidelines that we follow, and this is the 2020 American Heart Association, American College of Cardiology and Hypertrophic Cardiomyopathy guidelines for pregnancy explicitly say for women that have stable hypertrophic cardiomyopathy and are doing well, it is reasonable to advise that pregnancy is safe and can be pursued. Of course, we always have a conversation um, with the mother about her risks and the risks for the fetus, but in general, it's safe to go ahead. Some things to think about that are unique for pregnant women that have hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. So earlier we heard um, a little bit about atrial fibrillation, which is a heart rhythm from the top chambers of the heart that requires use of blood thinning medicine in patients with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, regardless of what other risk they might have for forming clots in the heart. So now when, when a woman is pregnant, you know, we're mindful of what is happening to the fetus and what is the risk to the baby for medications that the woman might be on. The most common blood thinner that is used for atrial fibrillation in the hypertrophic cardiomyopathy population is a medicine called warfarin. Um, warfarin is not safe for the baby if the dose is too high in the first trimester. So if we have women that are on this blood thinner warfarin um, during pregnancy at a dose of more than five milligrams, then we'll switch them to an injectable blood thinner just for the first trimester 
then switch them back to their oral warfarin medicine, their blood thinner. And then again, at the time of delivery, usually we actually bring them into the hospital um, so that they can be on an IV drip blood thinner medicine that can easily be turned off when baby is born, decrease the risk of any bleeding at the time of delivery. Similarly, other medications that women might be on when they are thinking about pregnancy with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy include beta blockers and calcium channel blockers. Almost all of these are generally considered safe. There's one in particular called atenolol that uh, we don't like to use because it's associated a little bit more with resulting in smaller size babies. Most antiarrhythmics, on the other hand, these are medications for heart rhythm problems are not safe for the baby, but there are some that are commonly used like digoxin and flucanide that are safe and that can be used throughout pregnancy. And then also the same applies for breastfeeding. So in general, the medications that are considered safe during pregnancy are all safe during breastfeeding. And then there's a few additional medications that can be used during breastfeeding um, that are not allowed at while pregnant actively just because they are not able to make it through the breast milk, but they might be able to cross the placenta. And then for delivery, vaginal delivery can be performed safely for the majority of women with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. So in general, just for cardiac reasons, we tend not to recommend a C-section, but if the obstetrics team uh, feels that the woman needs a C-section for other reasons, then of course we go with um, the decision that's made by the team together. Um, but just for cardiac reasons alone, unless the patient is doing extremely poorly or we're very concerned in general, vaginal delivery is just fine. And then going back to the point of, you know, we're counseling the mom and also thinking about the baby and what is relevant for the mom's other children. So we'll hear more about this later. So I'm not going to go into this too much, but prenatal genetic counseling should be considered in all women that have hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. And then we always have a conversation about screening relatives. So even if a woman's coming in, this is her second pregnancy, we'll usually say, well, have you had um, genetic testing? What do you think about uh, your other child either having genetic testing or getting these echocardiograms or ultrasounds of the heart to take a look and make sure everything um, is as expected or to catch the disease early if that's um, what will be happening. And then lastly, um, for all of our cardiac patients, any woman that has hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, it's our practice at our institution, and it's the practice for many of the larger centers now nationally to have a pregnancy heart team. So this means that we make decisions about care during pregnancy with an obstetrician, particularly a maternal fetal medicine specialist. So that's somebody who takes care of women with high-risk conditions during pregnancy, as well as their anesthesiology colleagues, our social workers, our pharmacists, um, primary care physicians, nursing staff, using a whole heart team together to take care of our patients actually has been shown to result in much better outcomes as in women doing much better throughout pregnancy and postpartum. So this is the way that we generally recommend that women with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy be managed during pregnancy. I'll now finish and turn over to Dr. Jim Gammy, who will be presenting on surgical considerations. Thank you, Adam. Um, I'm going to share my screen here. Are we good to go here? Folks see that? Great, fantastic. It's my pleasure uh, to um, share with uh, the, uh, this group, this wonderful group, uh, a little bit of information about uh, surgery and its role in hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. I think uh, you've all um, seen uh, the background, the speakers here uh, are, have been uh, fantastic. I wanna focus a little bit on understanding uh, uh, what the anatomy is and uh, how we think about uh, uh, surgery for hypertrophic uh, cardiomyopathy. One of my key points today is that uh, this is not really simply a, um, a, a muscular obstruction of uh, blood leaving the heart, but rather it's a uh, relationship between the mitral valve, uh, which is the inflow valve into the main pumping chamber of the heart and uh, the uh, septum uh, in hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. So this is the mitral valve and um, this is how the surgeon views it. This is the uh, anterior leaflet up at the top. 
and the posteriorly flat here. And right up at the top of this, you can see the, uh, the aortic valve. So that's how a, a normal mitral valve uh, functions. Uh, this is a um, uh, picture of the uh, mitral valve here. This is the anterior leaflet. And this is the uh, aortic root right here and the uh, aortic valve. And basically, the uh, heart has uh, is a cylindrical. And at the top of it, it's got an inflow valve, which is the mitral valve, which is D-shaped. And then it has an outflow valve, the uh, aortic valve on the right side. So that's sort of uh, how we, um, we, we think about that. And that leads to the uh, problems we have. And this is another way of uh, looking at the uh, at this and um, the uh, anterior mitral leaflet here is what uh, interacts with the uh, septum or the muscular wall of the heart. And this is another way uh, of looking at the mitral valve. This is looking uh, down, uh, this is looking from uh, downwards up. This, these are the chordae tendinae that support the two uh, leaflets. And you can see the anterior leaflet up here to the right is um, uh, switching back and forth. And I think you could also see the, uh, the aortic valve. So here's how a, a normal mitral valve and aortic valve work. Uh, uh, blood enters the heart with the, uh, during diastole with the uh, valve open. Uh, and then uh, when the uh, ventricle uh, contracts and squeezes, the mitral valve comes together and provides, there's adequate space here for uh, blood to uh, leave the heart. So that's a normal uh, mitral valve. And people who have hypertrophic cardiomyopathy there, the key thing to know is that there's an interaction between this anterior leaflet here and the septum. And so a patient who has a thickened septum from hypertrophic cardiomyopathy more than 13 to 15 uh, millimeters uh, is at risk for uh, interacting with this um, uh, anterior leaflet and essentially causing an obstruction uh, to uh, blood flow leaving the heart. So uh, the take home message here is that it takes two to tango should remember that uh, uh, both uh, you need an anterior mitral leaflet as well as a uh, septum that's hypertrophic in order to get uh, obstruction. And these are two different ways of uh, looking at that. You can see that in both of these cases, there is uh, this anterior leaflet is uh, uh, obstructing blood flow leaving the heart. And that's the fundamental problem. Um, and this is how I like to think of it. You guys see this video. This is the anterior leaflet here and uh, the uh, blood leaving the heart. Uh, this is uh, uh, how the anterior leaflet uh, gets uh, uh, in the way and uh, it won't get out of the way. Um, so that's, uh, that's how I uh, think about that. Um, and uh, here are some other diagrams, particularly over here on the left, uh, demonstrating uh, the obstructive process in a hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. So, um, we have uh, the primary way we have of, of addressing this is, uh, and, and by the way, this, this uh, diagram is uh, meant to remind me that not only does this uh, anterior leaflet obstruct blood flow leaving the heart, but by pulling that front leaflet forward, the two leaflets of the mitral valve don't come together properly and it causes mitral regurgitation. So this is during systole when the heart is squeezing, we have uh, blood going backwards through the mitral valve, which we call mitral regurgitation, and that can be uh, severe as well. So not only do we have obstruction to blood flow leaving, we also have uh, blood flow reversal. Turns out that the mitral valve is inherently abnormal in uh, patients with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. And essentially both of the leaflets uh, in uh, patients with this issue are longer than they should be. And these are some uh, uh, data uh, published in CIRC. And you can see that both the anterior leaflet as well as the posterior leaflet are longer uh, than they uh, should be in, in this condition. And that uh, uh, contributes to the uh, obstruction and problems that we see. So I think this has been discussed uh, previously, but the reason that we would think about septal reduction therapy and particularly surgical therapy is when a patient is optimized on medical therapy, uh, but is still having LVL flow tract obstruction and symptoms. And at that point, we would consider uh, either myectomy or uh, alcohol septal ablation. Now, myectomy has been around a long time. It was introduced by Andrew Morrow in 1961. Uh, and I'm going to talk a little bit more about that. There are some alternatives that have been uh, advanced. Uh, Denton Cooley, who many of you uh, may have heard of, is a famous surgeon. He had a simple way of addressing hypertrophic cardiomyopathy and outflow tract obstruction. He would simply replace the valve with a mechanical valve that was low profile. And while that solves the problem, it gives the patient the uh, morbidity and the risk of having a replacement valve. 
So this is uh, Moro's myectomy procedure here. And this is uh, what our goal is, is to uh, reduce that septum proximally here to cut it out and create a outflow tract where blood can leave the heart uh, undisturbed. And this is another uh, uh, diagram demonstrating that. You can see here, uh, typically what we'll do is uh, remove about uh, uh, 10 millimeters of septum down to about the level of the papillary muscle. Those are the two thumb-sized uh, muscles on the inside of the heart from which the chordae tendinae arise that uh, support the mitral valve. And this is how it looks uh, from a surg surgeon standpoint. We stop the heart, we look through the aortic valve, uh, which again is the uh, valve where the blood leaves the heart, and we can see the septum sticking, uh, sticking forward here. And in fact, a lot of times you can see a, a pearl uh, opalescent-like uh, uh, line on the surface of the septum where the anterior leaflet of the mitral valve has been uh, uh, banging away against it. And so uh, once this has been identified, uh, this is a fairly straightforward operation. The surgeon simply uh, cuts out uh, a, a wedge of uh, muscle, frees it up, as you can see here, in a stepwise fashion. Uh, this is another way of looking at it uh, down at the bottom. Uh, you can see a long axis. And uh, it's important that we uh, do what's called an extended myectomy, where we go all the way down to, uh, again, the level of the papillary muscles. Uh, and you can see that here, and we have various ticks, uh, trips, ticks, <laughs> tricks to uh, enhance uh, exposure. Uh, and just here's another uh, picture of that. And this is what uh, you wind up with. And I mentioned that uh, uh, area where the anterior leaflet was uh, impacting the septum, you can see there. This is a patient that I operated on a few months ago. Uh, this is preoperatively. And I'm just gonna orient you here. This is the uh, aortic valve to the right of the screen. Uh, and the septum is this uh, structure right here. And you can see the anterior leaflet of the mitral valve is in contact with the septum. I don't know if you can see my pointer. And when we put color flow Doppler on it, you can see color flow acceleration right here, which uh, suggests that there is, uh, is obstruction. Uh, this patient did have obstruction. And this is after surgery. And you can see that we've uh, removed a substantial amount of the septum here. And we have a nice wide passageway for blood to leave the heart, and there's uh, no evidence of contact of the anterior leaflet with the septum, uh, and there's no more uh, color flow acceleration. Um, we've learned uh, that this is not just an operation of uh, cutting some of the septum out, but in fact, a lot of these patients require uh, work on the mitral valve, and this is one example. Uh, we'll do a number of different things in the operating room to improve the overall structure of the outflow tract, and one of them is to reposition these papillary muscles as you see here in this, uh, in this uh, diagram. I want to share with you the amazing story of Dr. Morrow who invented this operation. He worked at the, uh, at the uh, NIH uh, back in the, in the 1960s and he worked with um, the, uh, uh, Eugene Bronwald who is the long-term editor of the textbook of cardiology and they were working together and he said, uh, Gene, will you listen to my heart? And he had a heart murmur. And uh, Gene Bronwald diagnosed him with obstructive hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. He was probably the 25th person in the world diagnosed with this. There were no echocardiograms available at that time. And Morrow went on uh, to uh, develop uh, the myectomy operation. And he had uh, this, he would wake up in the morning and would oftentimes uh, pass out, uh, would drink about 10 glasses of water a day. Uh, and uh, refused to have his own operation. He had two children, one who required a heart transplant for this and another who actually underwent the operation that his father developed. Um, I think uh, it was mentioned earlier that uh, a lot of, uh, a number of patients will come to the operating room with atrial fibrillation and we will do something called a maze procedure where we put uh, scar lines in the atria, the upper chambers of the heart and we've uh, published on this. This is how this looks. It adds 10, minute to the, 10 minutes to the operation, and we will uh, have a, a one-year freedom from AFib of about 76%, so we can add that uh, to a surgical approach here. Um, we also have other ways of doing this operation. Sometimes we'll go through the uh, mitral valve, we'll detach that, and we'll do what's called a transmitral myectomy, and here are some uh, pictures of that. And I'm gonna, spoiler alert here, I'm gonna show you some surgery if you wanna watch this. Um, this is the uh, anterior leaflet of the mitral valve. And uh, you can see the papillary muscles down there. And uh, this is the uh, septum, uh, which I'm putting a uh, suture in here. And you can again see 
where the anterior leaflet has been interacting with the septum where that, that white area is. And then what we'll do, this is a myectomy, and we'll simply uh, cut out a big chunk of uh, that muscle. Uh, and uh, this is uh, what that uh, operation looks like. And uh, in the interest of time, I'm just gonna keep uh, going on here. So uh, these are some national data and my Key point here is just that uh, about a third of the time people will have a mitral valve operation along with a myectomy. So uh, important to have in a specialized center that has experience with this. The mortality of this operation is very low, probably on the order of uh, 1%. The risk of a pacemaker is about uh, 4%. It's a very low volume uh, procedure at most uh, institutions. Uh, and if you have your operation at a high volume center, your mortality risk is less than 1%. So it's the safest heart operation that we do. After this procedure, you're highly likely to uh, have your symptoms resolved and your survival is uh, statistically uh, the same as a normal, uh, as a person without uh, this issue. So I'm gonna stop there and thank you very much uh, for your attention. Need to unmute yourself a bit. I was trying to hide my chat box, which was blocking my, my mute button. Everybody able to see my slides? All right, so my name is Rebecca McClellan. I'm one of the genetic counselors here um, at the Center for Inherited Heart Diseases. Um, and uh, I, I do do clinical genetic counseling, um, but tonight um, for the last few talks of the evening, we're going to be shifting gears just a little bit. Um, and we're gonna be talking about um, research and some research opportunities. Um, so uh, from my talk, I'm gonna be talking with you a little bit about um, just general um, being a part of research uh, and some um, things that I think are important to know as part of being a research participant um, for any study anywhere. Um, so first, um, you know, research um, in general is basically an organized activity designed to learn more about a problem or answer a question. Um, there are many different types of research, and I think that's important to talk about and go into briefly um, because a lot of people come in, uh, patients and individuals come into the research setting thinking it is taking a drug or doing, doing something or some kind of intervention um, that is always invasive. And so there, there are some research opportunities that are going to be that type of study. Um, but there are also many other different types of research that go on that are also very important contributions to understanding diagnoses. Um, so there are many studies that are considered observational studies where there are case series or case reports um, used to illustrate a certain aspect of a condition or a treatment. Um, many times case control um, uh, studies will identify two different groups, um, one who already had an outcome for example, patients with HCM who have already had a cardiac arrest and compare them to a group of patients um, who um, do not have that same outcome. So they'll do case control comparison studies um, and they'll see if that exposure or that, inter that, um, that, um, that basically that outcome, sort of how it, um, the similarities between the different groups. There are, are prospective cohort studies that will follow a group of, a large group of patients over time going forward. Um, and then you'll also sometimes hear the term retrospective studies, which are studies that use information that has been gathered or collected in the past. Um, a totally kind of different type of research is qualitative research. Um, and qualitative research is uh, used to basically gain an understanding of underlying reasons, opinions, motivations, um, a, the, around a certain question or a certain area. Um, these will often maybe interview studies, these might be focus group studies, um, things like that. Um, randomized controlled, this is what most people think of when they hear, hear the word research. So these are often where there is some intervention, this might be a drug, a product, an activity, 
um, that they're using in the study to see if it changes the behavior or the outcomes in a group of participants that are in that study. Um, in randomized controlled studies, patients or participants are usually randomly assigned to one group or the other. Um, and in some studies, you'll hear the term crossover, which means that the participants may be in one type of study arm or one assigned to one group and then switch over into the other group throughout the study. Um, in many randomized controlled studies, um, you'll also hear the terminology of being blinded or double blinded sometimes. And this basically means that participants and or um, the research team or most of the research team don't always know what group the participants have been assigned to. And those blind, uh, blind natures of the study are done to try to help um, minimize bias. Uh, you know, when participants or doctors know that you're getting the drug, or if a person knows that I'm getting a drug versus getting a placebo, um, people can often sometimes report things a little bit differently. So that blinding nature is used to try to help minimize some of that biased um, responses. There's also a category of research studies called systematic review and meta-analysis. Um, and these are based uh, studies that combine data from many different prior research studies. So that's kind of another big category of research studies. Um, some other kind of important things to know about research that you're, um, if you're invited to be a part of a research study that are important to understand is there's an entity called an Institutional Review Board or an IRB for short. Um, and this is basically a group of doctors, scientists, ethicists, community members um, who review and will monitor studies that involve human subjects. Um, they serve to really protect um, the participants' rights, welfare, and privacy. And the way I think about it is their job is to make sure that the study that, that's being offered to you has um, gone through all of the steps and is doing everything they can to make the risk to that participant as small as possible. Um, uh, all research studies um, require approval from an IRB um, before it can even start, before they can even start talking to you. Um, and researchers need to also submit annual updates to the IRB, and they have to have the IRB approve any changes to a protocol after the study actually starts. So if something needs to change along the way, it has to go back to that IRB for approval again. Another big part of research is informed consent. Um, and informed consent is basically the process of learning the key facts about a research study. Um, before you decide whether or not you want to be part of it. Um, the process um, will usually include a discussion of the study um, uh, in some context, in many studies, but not all. It will also include what's called an, an informed consent document um, that you'll be asked to sign and return. There are some studies where the protocol is designed where it's more of a verbal consent or there is not an actual document that you need to sign, um, but that would all be explained to you as part of the consent discussion process too. Um, some tips, I think, just for people who are going to consider an informed consent discussion um, is that uh, honestly take as much time as you need. Um, I never want uh, a participant to feel that they've rushed into a research decision and that they don't fully understand what they're signing up to be a part of. Um, I always encourage families uh, and patients to ask questions um, that this, this is a choice whether or not you want to be a part of the research. And so it's, uh, it's you know, your opportunity to make sure you understand what you're enrolling in. Um, and don't hesitate to take that form home if you want to read over it. In, our informed consent forms are daunting. They're multiple pages long and they're tiny prints and there's a lot of language in them sometimes. And so, you know, don't ever feel pressured to, you know, so have to sign on that dotted line right then and there. If you feel like you want to review the document in more detail, don't be afraid to say, I'd like to take it home and get back to you and, and follow up with you with questions. When people are making a decision about um, being a part of research or not, you know, one of the biggest things that, um, that a participant should really do is try to weigh the benefits of the risks of that study. Um, so uh, research study benefits may or may not be direct benefit to you. You know, it depends on the study. Um, it is, if it's a treatment study, you might improve, you might stay the same. Um, or you may develop some type of side effect. These are research studies. These are not proven therapies. So, um, so it's, uh, you know, no one can really predict the outcome of a research study or how it's going to affect you personally. 
We can give you as much information as we have as to why we're studying it, what we think the potential side effects are and things like that, but there's no guarantee um, of, of improvement with any kind of research study. Um, another big benefit and reason that many people will consider being part of research is that it helps provide answers for others in the future. So this idea of altruism or doing what you can to try to help sort of the greater good of the field and other patients with HCM. Um, and essentially, um, you know, it may help find cures that help an illness, but not maybe right now, but down the road. Um, so being a part of that bigger process. Some studies, not all, probably most studies, um, but some studies will sometimes have a benefit of compensation as part of that as well. Um, and if that is part of what's being offered with the study, you'll be, um, you'll be given that information as part of the consent process. Some risks that go with um, research um, participation, it really varies depending on the study. Um, these are going to be things that are going to be outlined for you in an informed consent document if there is known potential um, you know, side effects or risks of whatever the intervention is. Um, sometimes some of the qualitative research studies that get a little more in on the psychosocial aspects and emotional aspects of diagnoses in healthcare, um, sometimes they can be a little uncomfortable for people to think about or deal with. Um, sometimes the research studies can be a little nosy about people's pers personal lifestyle choices and things like that, so those can make folks uncomfortable as well. Um, and again, as I mentioned before, that sometimes drug or treatment trials may have a potential side effect that goes that comes up as part of the participation. So should you participate? Like, how do you decide? Um, you know, you um, as individuals with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, um, it's a rare condition. So you're in a very unique position to help us better understand it. But ultimately, it is your choice. Um, some important reminders as you consider whether or not you'd like to enroll in research is that if you are asked to participate, you do have the right to say no. You are always a volunteer. Um, your decision to be a part of the study or not is never going to affect your relationship with your doctor, with your healthcare provider, or with anyone at your hospital that's kind of offering you that research opportunity. Um, you should always take the time to weigh both the benefits and the limitations and risks before you decide and take as much time as you need to make the decision. Um, and always know that even after you do decide to join a study, you have a right to stop your participation at any point in time. You just need to let the study team know. So with that, um, you know, this is sort of a primer to just talk with you a little bit about being a research participant. Um, our next speaker is going to share with you some of the different opportunities that have uh, passed and uh, recent past and present that are going on at Hopkins. Um, but I just wanted to extend my gratitude to all of our HCM patients and families and our care team as a whole. I've been working as a Jenna counselor for almost 20 years now and enjoy very much what I do. And we have a great team um, and I'm grateful for uh, my role with this clinic. All right, well, thank you all. Um, I am the last speaker for tonight. My name is Cindy James. I am a genetic counselor and also a geneticist and the research director here at our Center for Inherited Heart Diseases. And I'm gonna follow along um, what Rebecca was just talking about and talk a little bit about some of the research studies we are doing or have recently been doing here in HCM, including um, GWAS, which are genome-wide association studies and other studies. Uh, and so in the next 10 minutes or so, I'm going to talk just briefly about our philosophy toward um, HCM research here at Johns Hopkins. Um, I'm a geneticist, so I'm going to talk about genetics research, talk a little bit more about lifestyle research, particularly research related to exercise, and then talk about some practicalities, nuts and bolts of joining research. So our research here at Johns Hopkins is multidisciplinary. Um, our HCM research includes lab scientists, pediatric and adult cardiologists, surgeons, imaging professionals, geneticists, genetic counselors, and so on. And while my colleagues here who are physicians um, who talk to you today about all their areas of expertise, most of them are also researchers who are interested in particular aspects of HCM. For example, Dr. Crispin, who you heard earlier, is really got an um, expert research program on looking at 
specific aspects of MRI imaging to help predict who's likely to develop an arrhythmia. Um, our research is also collaborative. Some of our HCM research we do just at Johns Hopkins, but we are also participants in a lot of multi-center studies, um, both in the US and worldwide. All right, so I'm a geneticist. I am gonna talk a little bit about the genetics research here. For those of you who attended the last session and for those of you who are patients, I think most of you know, HCM is considered a condition of the sarcomere. Most of the genes we know, the major genes we know that are associated with HCM are sarcomere genes, which are over here. However, not everyone who has HCM has a mutation, which we actually call a pathogenic variant in a sarcomere gene. And as those of you who live in families with HCM know, having a mutation in one of your sarcomere genes does not mean you're certainly going to get HCM. In fact, this is a really nice study out of the UK published recently that took 285 um, adult and pediatric carriers of these pathogenic sarcomere variants and followed them over time. This is one of these observational perspective studies Rebecca was talking about. And you can see here um, that among the women in red followed 15 years, um, less than a third of people had developed HCM with um, males at a little bit higher risk of developing HCM. And so the question is, why is that? Um, and really the key here is we know that the genes you're born with plus the environment interact in really personal ways to go from whatever your genetic background is to what happens. And this genetic background we're worried about are both these um, rare variants, so these sarcomere variants, and also common variants. Just changes in your differences in DNA that makes uh, my DNA different from your DNA, different from Rebecca's DNA. These are common variants everybody has. And in HCM research, there's been some really important research papers in the last year looking at differences in common variations to try to predict who's likely to develop HCM. All right, and this uses a technology called the GWAS, a genome-wide association study, which is an approach, it's actually a case control approach following on Rebecca's language to compare the genomes, the DNA of lots of different people, thousands and thousands and thousands of people to find genetic markers associated with a particular disease or risk of disease, in this case, a risk of HCM. Um, and so they compare DNA at at least 500,000 sites in your genome. So lots of little, little bits of DNA. And they try to, and they find areas that look like this, variations that are more common in people with disease than without. They put all this together to calculate something called a polygenic risk score. So scientists add up the total number of risk increasing and risk decreasing variants along with their magnitude of impact. So this is potentially in the future helpful information to try to figure out who's at risk, most at risk for developing HCM. It also allows you to look at environmental factors. So you can say, okay, after accounting for your polygenic risk score, after accounting for genetics, let's look and see what the other risk factors are. And so for an example, in this really nice paper, it says, wow, for um, this group of individuals with HCM who don't have a sarcomere mutation, wow, your diastolic blood pressure appears to be a really important risk factor and maybe less so as a risk factor in people who were born with a sarcomere mutation. And then even in people born with a sarcomere mutation, the polygenic risk score approach can help differentiate who's most at risk for developing HCM. And so what's next? The reason I'm spending time talking about this is the Johns Hopkins HCM program right now is in the process of joining an international GWAS research study led by some of our colleagues in Canada. These scores aren't ready for clinical care yet, they're in research. Um, of course, standard genetic testing for sarcomere variants for HCM and, and other HCM genes is available now. Um, and we're also, this is a complicated topic, conducting research to optimize the genetic counseling and testing process for you and your family. Um, so as Rebecca talked about being asked to join research, if you're a patient coming to our Center for Inherited Heart Disease for HCM Genetic Counseling and Testing. Oh, from next September onwards, um, we have a grant from the NHGRI, the National Human Genome Research Institute, part of the NIH, 
to evaluate two complementary video-based approaches to shifting the genetic counseling session to after you've already had your genetic test results in hand. And so that's something you may be invited to join in the future. It involves questionnaires, you get paid to participate, um, and so on. All right, so we talked a little bit about genetics research. We've also been involved in this other side of the equation, um, how individual environmental factors play a role and who develops HCM. Um, and Dr. Madrazo really did a beautiful draw job describing the evolution and guidelines in exercise and HCM. Um, our program here has spent the last four or five years or so participating in a worldwide research study to address this question. This is called the Live HCM study. It's led by uh, Rachel Lampert, Mark Ackerman, and Charlene Day, investigators in the US. And the goal of this study is to look at the incidence of arrhythmic events. So what Dr. Barth and Dr. Crispin talked about in patients with HCM over three years of follow-up and specifically compare outcomes of people who are exercising, moderately exercising and not exercising, also looks at quality of life. Um, and participants are kids and adults. And the really nice thing about this study is in contrast to the really focused study Dr. Madrazo described, this really takes patients, um, you can see here 2,300 HCM patients and people who are at risk by being family members from around the world and really looks at your own outcomes. So this study is done enrolling. We're in follow-up and we're looking forward to um, having data for the study to help answer some of the questions on exercise. And our long-term goal is having evidence-based personal exercise prescriptions for you based on your genetics, based on your clinical situation and so on. All right, so that's just a snapshot of some of the work we're doing here. There's lots more. And if you'd like to get involved, you might wanna consider joining our Center for Inherited Heart Disease Research Registry. This involves having an informed consent discussion like Rebecca just discussed, signing the consent form. We'd ask you to send us any cardiac and genetic records um, related to HCM you had that aren't already in our Hopkins system. And maybe in the future, consider sending a saliva sample for DNA if we ask you to. Um, adults and kids diagnosed with HCM can join or people who have a family member with HCM. Uh, and then this is sort of the front door to some of our other HCM studies. Once you join the registry, we, we know you're um, you know, a person who might be interested in joining things in the future. So if that's something that appeals to you, don't hesitate to reach out to either me personally or to our program. All right, again, I'm gonna thank um, our funders for this webinar series, as well as our grant funders that I just talked through. And that is the end of our uh, webinar today. I think we've saved some time for questions.